So this runs on the Pi, and its outputs include controlling a valve. So when, when it gets an input saying that the water level is at a certain level, then it operates the valve accordingly. It also sends more MQTT messages out to a server. And there's another instance of Node-RED running on the server. And what that does is takes the messages from the Pi and outputs it to various data logging and dashboards and things like that, which we'll talk about further on. So um, we've got this system sort of managed to hack it together, thanks to all the open source bits we used. Got it working on the bench. Great, fantastic. Came for installation day, and that's when the problems sort of started. We um, hadn't quite planned out the exact route for the cables, and they turned out to have to go over the ceiling. Um, so we had to suddenly add five meters to all of the lengths of the cables. Some of the sensors coped fine with that. Some of them didn't. Um, so um, I, I'm not exactly sure why, but I think it was things like trying to run I squared C over long cables without proper termination and things like that. So um, we came up with a solution to that, which I'll, I'll save for later. Um, but once we got over those sort of hurdles, we were still seeing problems with the Pi, every, sometimes every few days, but sometimes it would go a few weeks before just crashing. And um, spent quite a lot of head scratching and research and trying different things out. I spent a long time tracking down SD card problems, because those are well known to be a bit of a, an issue with the Raspberry Pi. But um, I eventually decided that it might well be power supply fluctuations. So I replaced the cheap wall wart um, type power supply with these little beauties, which aren't expensive. They're only about 13 quid or something. They'll give you an absolutely rock solid three amps at five volts, more than enough to power the Pi and the Arduino and all the sensors. And since then, we've had very few sort of unexplained crashes. Um, We've also just recently um, got um, a battery-backed UPS because I don't know if any of you have been in Todmorden over the summer, but apparently the whole town has had a, quite a series of power problems. And, and even when the power does stay on, it sometimes browns out quite a lot. So, of course, the UPS will help fill in those gaps. So, um, yes, so the solution to the um, wired sensors problem was to go wireless. So... Um, we made a, we've got a range of wireless sensors now, and you can come and have a look at the end if you like. But um, basically, um, we got the battery life, which was the main thing I was worried about, up to about two years. I mean, you haven't had two years to test it, but based on the small amount it's been using so far. Um, and the reason that you can get two years out of a sensor is, of course, that you spend almost all of your time asleep. Um, just wake up, send data, and go back to sleep again really quickly. And that's been another validation of our choice of MQTT. Because you've got the minimum overhead, you can wake up, send your data, go back to sleep in you know, 50 milliseconds or something. You know, and you'd be doing TCP and Wi-Fi handshaking for you know, 10 times that long. Uh, we've also added in a, um, a 3G dongle. And so we've got text alerts um, straight from the device um, and backup connectivity because um, if the internet goes down, of course, then you don't even get to hear about that. You know. um, we've also got power socket switching now, so um, rather than have to get into the whole messy and dangerous business of homemade electronics and mains electricity, just um, buy some cheap and cheerful remote control power switches from Maplin, and you hack the remote control end. Um, and um, we're also <laughs> logging to a database um, we've been through a couple of different options, including Redis. Um, we're currently using Cassandra, which I don't know if anyone knows, but um, is pretty hardcore um, and maybe a bit too rich for our blood. So we, uh, we asked a question on the IRC channel, and we were told, like, oh, two nodes is not a typical deployment. You know, kind of. So um, we might uh, revisit that question. I'm not sure. So what happens to all this data? Like we're logging it, and then what? You know, we're reading all these sensors. What we're we doing with this data? Well, there's two main things at the moment, and one of them is this dashboard. The dashboard itself on the right 
we didn't do any of that design or any of that code really. We just took an open source project called freeboard.io and plugged it in and it worked immediately. It's really good, highly recommend it. The node red code on the left is just to show how simple it is to get a dashboard like that up and running. Um, on the left we've got all the MQTT messages coming in. Then we've got some rounding and adding some bits and pieces, adding some timestamps and stuff. It saves it in a buffer and then it just makes it available over a web socket and the dashboard comes and picks it off when it wants it. So nice and easy. The other thing um, Gareth mentioned that data is also being logged to Cassandra. Well, that data in Cassandra is now made available over an open data API. Um, there's there's more code running on the server which uses Node.js Express and it also uses this amazing open source thing called Swagger, swagger.wordnik.com and that allows you to embed documentation in your code so it's very similar to Javadoc and then you install the Swagger UI and the Swagger UI translates that generated JSON from the documentation and produces a web page that you can interact with so we'll give you the links at the end. It'll be better, easier for you to see it live. But basically, it gives you a web page that documents your API. But you can also click and put in, for example, I want the air pump current data from this date to this date. And I want the first 10 records. Press go. And if you get the data that you expect, then you know the API is working. Uh, yeah, and this one, as you see, it's slash Todmorden. And the reason we've bothered to put Tomadon is we're hoping that in the future there'll be other aquaponic systems exposing their data in a similar way. So eventually we'll be able to collect that data with a unified API linking different systems. And that would allow for research into aquaponics at a scale that I don't think has been done yet, at least certainly not openly. So um, we're giving away all this stuff, um, which is lovely, but um, you know we still need to pay for beer and other essentials. So um, you know how do we do that? Well, um, it's a question we're still working on, to be honest. But um, we basically we're going to be following or following a mixed model. So uh, we're selling some of our stuff, you know, roll up, roll up, um, but we can't sell it for a huge amount of money because. Making stuff in the UK in small numbers is inevitably going to be five, ten times more expensive than you can buy it from China. So we're going to have to augment that with some support. Um, so we might um, collect people's data and give them a simple dashboard for free, but we might maybe do an alerting service on top for a small subscription or something like that. And um, as well as that, um, by getting systems to contribute their data together and pooling it, um, we'll be kind of curating this data set and that will hopefully put us in a position to be able to apply for some research grants and some other grants to support sort of open data and that sort of thing. So by mixing all these things together, we won't be relying on any one kind of plank and hopefully that will supply us with enough beer to keep us happy. Um, <laughs> And, of course, because this is an open project, uh, we need you. Um, we, we've got quite a few gaps in our system that we'd like to fill. We're hoping that people here will either want to join in or know people that will want to join in. Um, if you're good at security and authentication, please make yourself known to us afterwards. We wouldn't mind some help with a database. Um, I, having got the power consumption down so low with these things, I think uh, it's possible that we could have a solar cell on top and even indoors harvest enough energy to just keep the things going forever. So you'd never have to worry about batteries, you wouldn't have to charge them, you wouldn't have to you know, have the environmental impact of batteries and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and of course the wireless um, sensors also give a great decoupling point. Um, and because the base station is based on a Raspberry Pi and it's very cheap, we could quite conceivably have a multiple base stations for redundancy and multiple sensors for redundancy. And then if any one element of the system suffers a crash, it can just carry on. So, um, yeah, if you know things about Quorum and um, those sorts of, you know, overlay file systems, then, again, <laughs> come up. And um, your ideas as well. 
Um, I mean, so far, we, we're working in, a, in an aquaponics context, but a lot of this stuff could carry over to home monitoring, environmental monitoring, various sorts of monitoring. Um, so your ideas would help sort of us extend these projects, really. Yeah. So, um, yeah, oh yeah, we're doing a workshop tomorrow. Um, so um, we've got a couple of different things and you can play with either or both of them. Um, we've got a boatload of sensors, um, temperature, pressure, heartbeat, that one is, current monitoring, all kinds of things like that. So if you've got ideally a Raspberry Pi or something else, come along, we can help you connect up sensors and read the data and then do something with it, maybe talk to an app or, or one of those dashboards, for example. And we've also... Yeah, we've also got, um, obviously, the, the API. So if you're interested in using that data, it is a little bit sketchy because we've been recording it over the last few months and we've had the odd issues here and there. But, you know, there's quite a lot of data there. And if you're interested in developing like a mobile app or a web app or anything like that, then that could be another thing to do at the workshop. So it's hardware or software, really, whatever you're most interested in. Just a few links then. So uh, the top one is just our blog, where Gareth especially has written a lot about the sorts of things we've been talking about today. Um, there's the link there for the dashboard, the API. We've got a little app where you can download the data as CSV. Yeah, we're, um, we've entered the Hackaday Prize. So if anyone's um, following that, um, please come and find us and vote for us, and we'll go to space. <laughs> Yeah, then uh, we're Layer Zero Labs on GitHub. We've got all our code up there. I'm afraid the documentation is all a little bit possibly lacking. There's some readmes that might be a little bit out of date because we're working really, really fast, so we can't always keep up with ourselves. So if you want to download our code and look at it, which we'd be really grateful for any feedback, and you find the documentation lacking, just drop us an email. We're very happy to get emails at info at l0l.org.uk. But if you're interested in particularly in the aquaponics, then that's the collaboration that we're doing with Paolo, and that's called aquaponicslab.org. I'm going to hand out some cards, but um, that's our address there. So I don't know if this is going to be put on the web, because all these links are a bit long to copy. But yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll make the slides available. Okay. So, um, yeah, questions? <laughs>